from the mile high city, we're all high here, but not for the reasons that you might think. It's because we're a mile high. Joel Com here for Joel.live and glad that you would be able to join me for the replay. That's right, the replay, because those of you who weren't here live, you're seeing the replay now. <laughs> so I'm actually from the past speaking into your present to impact your future. I just came up with that. That's pretty good. I might have to stick with that. Anyway, as you're coming in, uh, please do share the broadcast. Got a killer show for you today. Not that I have a killer on the show, but he's got a killer voice and a killer talent, which so, you know, you better you better be prepped and ready for that. And as you guys come in, um, I want to remind you, if you are watching this on a shared video page, then you want to make sure to come to where the video is actually broadcasting from if you want to be able to make comments that I can see. And that's on the BeLive TV app page, facebook.com forward slash BeLive TV app. So that's where you have to go. If you're watching this on any of the shared pages, you can watch there and you can comment there, but we won't see your comments and that'll just hurt our hearts just a little bit because we want to know what you have to say. So go to facebook.com forward slash be live TV app. That way I can call out people like Cheryl and say, Hey Cheryl, how you doing? Hey Steve, good to see you. Fernando, welcome to the program. Uh, Michelle, you are in for a treat. I had an opportunity to speak with my guest here just a little bit beforehand, and it's going to be a great show. Eileen, nice to see you as well. And uh, Cheryl, you're asking me who's on the show. It's right. It's written out right there so you can see it. So please do share that we are live right now. And, uh, you know, I know it takes people some time to get in here, but we wait for nobody. We wait. Now, I do have a piece of news before I get started with Joel.live here today for this beautiful Friday afternoon. Or those of you watching the replay, it's the weekend. Hello, weekend. As of Monday, I will be relinquishing my duties as the host of Be Live Weekly. That's right. All my travels um, around the world are just making it prohibitive for me to do two shows a week. But I have really great news. Somebody better than me, somebody more equipped, somebody younger, somebody better looking, somebody funnier, somebody more talented than myself, is, which is not hard to do, by the way, any of those things. <laughs> is going to be taking over Be Live Weekly starting on Monday the, let's see, what's the date? Monday the 22nd of January, the one and only Owen Video, Owen Hemseth, is going to be taking over Be Live Weekly um, starting on Monday. And so you guys aren't going to want to miss that because Owen rocks. Hello, Desiree. Nice to see you. And Cheryl, if you're driving, you be careful. No texting, typing and driving. Okay, so with no further ado, it is time to bring my guest on for this week. Uh, this guy is so talented, you might recognize him from a the voice on a television commercial. He's he has um, his voice has been lent to many different brands. He's also sung with some of the major musicians in their bands of our time, and he was on the Blake Shelton team on season eleven of The Voice. You guys watch The Voice, like people who can actually sing. Yeah, unlike me, I'm the karaoke voice guy. I can carry a tune in a bucket but it's a leaky bucket, so it doesn't go too far. I'm the karaoke guy. Uh, but this guy has real talent. His name is Dan Schaefer, and he's with me here today. Welcome to the program, Dan. How you doing, buddy? Welcome, Joel. It's such a privilege and an honor to be here with you. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, the, the privilege is all mine, and uh, as well as those who are watching who are going to get to hear um, some spontaneous performances from you today. So uh, I know you have your guitar handy, so we're going to, we'll hold off on that for just a little bit, but uh, you oh, know, I, as, as we were talking beforehand, there's one thing that I just noticed about you. You, you just have a kind face. You just look like a really nice guy. Well, I don't know about that, but I, I do my best to, uh, to <laughs> at least to serve and to uh, be humble. And I think that's the best way to go through life. Um, that's not to say that I can't be, uh, difficult at times as we most, <laughs> as a lot of us are, but, uh, but I appreciate your saying so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we all have our moments, right? I mean, no, none of us, you know, walking the earth here are perfect and that's right. we lose our cool or, you know, we do something that hurts somebody else. But I think, you know, what's in the heart, what our intent is, yes, is what really matters and what God sees, right? 
That's exactly right. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm human like everybody else and, uh, praise God that, uh, I can be, uh, forgiven on a second by second basis. So, and, uh, you know, that's a good thing for me anyway. <laughs> You've made an entire career out of music. Uh, let, let's turn back the way back machine because I want to hear sure. a little bit of your story. You know, when did you first get into music? Were you a boy or was it not until later? Well, I, I have to say that I, my earliest recollections were when I was about seven years old or so. And uh, I'd be swinging on my swing and, and just rocking back and forth. And, and I'd be singing Ben by Michael Jackson. And I, and I just noticed in my own little way that my voice uh, matched his. You know, your ears can see how you match things. And, um, you know, by the time I was 10, I wanted to start playing guitar. And, and uh, my, my mother was gracious enough to allow me to get one. <laughs> and uh, by the time I was 14 and 15, I was already playing in in clubs and little bars and campsites with bandmates and finding fellows to play with, uh, that shared the same desire to just play and enjoy music. You know, it wasn't, you know, about money or wasn't about fame or anything about that. It was just making great rock and roll music, you know, and, uh, you know, I remember being a little kid, you know, just probably about that six, seven, you know, year old age, uh, group somewhere on in there and listening to 45s you know and uh of the big bopper and and just just rock and roll basically because my 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 mother had records you know the del shannons and you know the 50s stuff that they were listening to and then eventually um you know all that our our seeds that were embedded in me i guess not even you know recognizing that but yet they were seeds that were absorbed and uh but yeah, I was a boy. And then by the time I was, you know, in high school, I already knew what I wanted to do with life. And, uh, and for me, that's what I had pursued. So I played clubs for year after year after year, three, four hours a night, every night, you know, 40, 50 cover songs and, and songs that uh, would eventually become the seeds that allowed me to write and grow and perform and, and so forth. So uh, it's been a long time, actually. So uh what so was the first uh, the the first big break? The thing where you you know couldn't wait to call family, friends, spouse, whoever to say, "Oh my gosh, you're not going to believe what just, what's happening." Well, I think it was just the opposite. My uh, my wife called me. I was working at a deli uh, called I'll never forget it, Carbone's Deli in in Torrington, Connecticut, and I love that that job. I I was working several jobs. I was working uh, selling food by day, working at a deli by night. Uh, and then going back and forth to Manhattan every day, trying to get, uh, you know, get involved with jingles and so forth. And I was working at the deli one night and my wife called me all, his, you know, excited, Dan, Dan, turn on channel, whatever it was. And, uh, my matchbox lightning key car commercial was running for the first time and it oh. went national and it was before I even knew that it went national. And, uh, so we were all excited, and Jamie, my, my oldest son, at the time was only about three years old, so he was running around the house getting all excited, too. So it was really an emotional moment just for, uh, you know, for me anyway. And then, uh, uh, But that would probably be the first really national uh, thing that I have, you know, at least rec you know, recollect anyway. I mean, there were things before that, too, you know, hearing your songs, you know, on radio for the first time, uh, you know, that, too, was... Very exciting, you know, but in the jingle world, Matchbox was probably the beginning of many things to come at the time, not knowing it, but uh, it, it, it came, you know, and uh, but it was it was a tough haul just to get to that point, you know, and uh, I would commute from Torrington. Uh, I was Torrington, Connecticut, and I would travel down to South Norwalk, which is about maybe an hour, an hour and a half away, get on the metro and go into New York City, which is another hour, an hour and a half away. And then get to your destination, I would cut these routes every every day. I'd start on 42nd, go all the way up to 57th, you know, or near the park on Monday. You know, find every jingle house and, you know, knock on the door, show up for coffee and just say hello, be kind to everybody. And then on Tuesday, I'd go from 42nd Street down to Chelsea. And then from, you know, Wednesday from Chelsea, you know, from 42nd down maybe to Bowery or wherever, or, you know, to, to wherever I was uh, going at the time. And, uh. And eventually, by doing that, you know, working two, three, four jobs, and it was just, um, 
it was just a commitment that I had. And uh, so to hear lightning key cars come on the, you know, come on television, it was just, uh, it was, it was just a, a wonderful thing, a wonderful experience. I think for me anyway, my my family was excited too. So. Oh, I'm, I'm sure they were. So uh, from Jingles and doing that successfully, what was the leap then? When was your first interaction with, you know, somebody that you considered, um, you know, a mainstream popular musician that you were like, oh, my gosh, I get to sing with or play with who? Um, I, well, the first one that pops in my mind is probably Carmine Apiece from Vanilla Fudge. Drummer. And, yeah, drummer Carmine was great. Um, I mean, there was lots of people way before that, but that was the first person that popped in my mind. So I figured, you know, I loved Carmine and Vinny. You know, I I, I sang on the drum war to the tours. They they were doing the drum war tour, and I had done a show or two with with uh, with Carm. Well, I probably sang with him two, three, four times. So, mm-hmm. but uh, but I would say Carmine was probably the first uh, person that I really. Uh, but there was you know several people, lots of people that were involved. You know, Al Anderson from NRBQ was, the, in fact, if it wasn't for Al Anderson, I don't think I'd even be in Jingles because he was the one that really encouraged me to get into Jingles because he was doing the Cheerio commercials, even though he's writing, you know, uh, 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 what, the, what was that song? Uh, uh, Playing with the Queen of Hearts, you know, or, you know, he was all these great songs. That, he that Juice already, Newton? Yeah, Juice Newton. He was writing for all these big people and uh, doing commercials at the same time. You know, Michael Bolton, too, at the same time. Michael was doing all the, the Kodak commercials and, and all of that, and, um, but still in blackjack. And so a lot of the fellows in that band, like, you know, uh, Sandy Gennaro and, and, and just a variety of guys that are now here in Nashville, we all go back to that, which was back during the 80s, you know. So, um, so I'm all over the place, so forgive me. <laughs> but, oh, that's great. Yeah, before, but, uh, before he sang How Am I Supposed to Live Without You, he was singing for Kodak, How Do I Take Pictures Without You, right? That's right. Something like that. I think it was. No, I think it was Daddy's Little Girl. I think it was, or I can't remember mm. the, the campaign. But it was a, it was sweet. You know, it was very. It was it was a wonderful campaign. Well, you know, a lot of the guys that do uh, commercials, jingles, and you play as you know backing or support vocals for um, musicians, uh, you don't always get front and center. But no. that changed for you when you auditioned for The Voice. Yes, and you were invited for a blind audition. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's correct. I had a a, a, a private uh, audition. I had been asked maybe two three times, and I, to be honest with you, was was really against the whole concept of, you know, the television shows, the the people that were, you know, because a lot of those folks really didn't go through the process that a lot of people had to go through. And um, anyway, long story short, um, I had decided at the, you know, a friend of mine said, Dan, you know, I'd like to book you. And I think that if you started, you know, if you got on The Voice, it would shine light on what already exists. And uh, and I said, well, let's do it. Then I'll I'll do it. He kind of said, well, hey, so-and-so is doing it. And I said, well, if he's doing it, I'm going to do it. We went together, a friend of mine. His name was Thane. I'll just leave it at that. But and um, so we both went and uh, I went to a private audition and the next thing you know, I was in L.A. for the uh, the executives uh, for NBC and um, on camera and and all of that. And it was just a wonderful experience. So and uh, it really did shine light on, uh, you know, bringing it forward to where it was. So and I'm showing right now uh, we don't have the audio from it, but I'm showing people. Uh, let's see if I can turn this up here a little bit. Sure. So OK. You can hear this is uh, from The Voice. Music 
Absolutely beautiful. Um, well, thank you. Be, I appreciate it. Being a, a fan of Train um, and uh, their music, I love that you picked that song. Uh, it's just wonderful. And, you know, if I, if I go towards the end of the video, they're just, they're blown away. They're just, they absolutely loved you. The audience is going like this and yeah. they just yeah. fell in love with you. When I look yeah. at them, they're just, they're standing and yeah, actually, well, what, what did that feel like? Well, it was an amazing feeling. I think, you know, um, I actually had a standing ovation as I was walking out. I mean, as I was walking down, Miley and 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 Adam and everybody just came running up to to hug me. You could see actually Miley pushing Blake aside just to get to me, you know. And uh, it was just an honor. And uh, you know, I think they saw old school. Uh, they they saw, like Miley said, you know, was her definition of. Uh, but she had mentioned that I was the image of hope, you know, and it's just uh, she had said something to the effect that her dad did the same thing. You know, when when he had Miley, that he gave up going on the road and giving up, you know, a lot so he can. And it made more sense to me now after talking with her why he went into to be the doctor, you know, in a television show and, and all that, because it was more consistent. He was home at night and he had this little baby girl that he had to take care of. You know, I mean, we all have to make choices, you know, and we have to figure out what is important to us. But I think Miley, you know, I just think that she was the most loving, uh, nurturing individual. I know a lot of people like are going to get mad at me and say, Oh no, she's this. And I know, Hey, I was 20 something years old too at one time, you know, yeah, I did a yeah, lot she, of foolish things. She's kind of coming around, isn't yeah. she? Oh, she's, she's yeah. I, you know, look, I mean, I don't try to judge and all that, but you know, cause mm -hmm. we all have our things, but to me, she was compassionate. She very, I mean, she would from 50 feet away, even though she was with her makeup people, would stop just to come over to me and give me a hug and ask me how I was doing, you know, I mean, and, uh, so, but her Alicia, but you know, at the end of that actual audition, Alicia and Adam, everybody was just so kind and, uh, very loving. And I have nothing but praise for the, for the, the, uh, staff and everybody, uh, you know, what, what a great experience. Uh, one of our yes. viewers wants to know what was your most unexpected takeaway from your experience on the voice? Um, well, prob probably that, how sweet the staff was and how sweet Miley was and, uh, you know, how great everybody was from Michelle, from casting, uh, everybody, you know, Chad, uh, the producers of the show, uh, they were just the most nurturing, loving people uh, that you could meet, you know. Um, they took care of everybody that was on The Voice. They took care and... I don't want to say coddle because that might seem, you know, uh, uh, too mushy, but they really did care uh, for everybody that was on the show. And it's, it's the real deal. I mean, the voice to me is the real deal. I mean, it's a television show. You go into it expecting that it's a reality show. Uh, and there's certain things that, you know, like television, you have to plan certain things out. Otherwise, it just can get kind of weird on you. You know, you have to plan for mistakes and you have to plan for things. But, uh, but once, you know, uh, you know, on the show, I mean, they're, they're just incredible. I, I, at least I think anyway. So there's not too much negative. But, uh, but I think the takeaway that I would leave for – I will say that uh, being with Bette Midler was great. It allowed me to uh, – she opened my eyes. You know, I've always been one of these fellows, like she, Blake knew and they knew, that I was behind the scenes. And uh, she, she said, Dan, you're not a cover band. You're Dan. You know, and uh, so uh, it, it kind of brought to light that I needed to step out, become more of a performer, engage myself with the audience. Uh, and I've loved that. And uh, ever since then, that so I've taken more than just one thing. I've taken it's been a life changing experience for me. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, personally, you know, you can't ex like any other thing. You can't expect the show to do anything for you. You have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and allow whatever uh, opportunities that maybe God has placed before you and say, okay, I'm going to go, I'm just stepping out here and I'm just going to dive right in and go with it, you know, and, uh, what comes of it comes of it. What doesn't, that's okay too. You yeah. know? So anyway, I'm well, let, let's yeah. speaking of diving in, you have your guitar sitting right there. Oh uh, yeah, I do pick it up and uh, maybe we'll do this a couple times, but I would love if you would uh, play us Ooh. a song. Sure, that'd be all right. Regale us with a tune, if you would, and I'll just—I'm going to just put you on full screen so they don't have to look at me. Okay. And uh, those of you just joining in, uh, this is Dan Schaefer. Great. He is going to 
do his thing. Go for it. This is something that, that I had written for another artist. Uh, but I've in my live shows, I've been doing on my own. So anyway, it, uh, hopefully you can hear all this. Anyway, it's something called Tell Me One More Lie. So hope you like it. Take a pass out of your shoulder It's just another load to carry You can lock a vase in your suitcase, baby I've got the spare key there Promises made on the cool summer's grass Make them love and love when it don't last no. Tell me that you want to hear you. The future's ours and it's all so clear. Tell me I'm your Mr. Right. And you tremble when I hold you tight. You can't live without me by your side. No, tell me. Tell me one more lie. As you're looking in your rearview mirror, and it all fades away. What about that new life that you had to have? When its colors start to gray Promises made of every clear blue sky Ain't so clear now with tears in your eyes Tell me, baby, do you hear? The future's yours and it's all so clear Is he still your Mr. Right? Do you tremble when he holds tight? But will he be there for the rest of your life? Tell me, sugar. Tell me one more lie. You see, the time has a way of healing. But tell me why am I still grieving? Guess I'm holding on to a place long ago But it's so hard to let go Ooh. Tell me what I want to hear, baby The future's ours and it's all so clear Yeah, yeah, yeah Tell me I'm your own Mr. Right And you tremble when I hold the time You won't live without me by your side Tell me, sugar Tell me one more Tell me one more lie Tell me one more Tell me one, tell me one, tell me one more lie. Oh, tell me one more lie, baby. Oh, please, tell me one more lie. Beautiful. Nice love song. Oh, well thank you done. so much. Who, who did you write that for? Well, I wrote it for Jeff Carson, who was on Curb Records at the time, and uh, but ended up losing his, his deal in all of that. So, But you know, he did such a wonderful job on the recording, and uh, it was just an honor to hear his voice on it. But 
But I, you know, it's like uh, I've written so much for a lot of different people that I figured, well, it's time now to maybe share some of my songs myself, you know, go on out and do them and um, do it, you know, uh, <laughs> just just do songs that I love to do anyway. So, in fact, that's the whole, my whole, this past year, I did so many shows. Uh, I did some shows with Dolly and, and John Wysocki from the group Stained and Artist Paul from Leonard Skinner and uh, just a lot of people, and um, it just dawned on me the, the type of show that I really want to do, which is very, it's very focused on intimacy and connectivity. I think those are things that are just so important, you know, because you can stand in front of 20,000 people, but it's not the same thing as in front of 1,000 people to me, or 300 people, in fact, you know. Um, I think those are the two things that are really missing in, in our current society in the climate not to get weird or anything on anybody but i think we long for intimacy that touch you know to be connected to something um and not to be bombarded with ideologies and and that sort of thing and uh and i've been finding that like i just did a show at the arcada theater up in chicago with artemis pile of leonard skinner and to have the whole audience sing along with you and to just connect on that music is just something that's a wonderful thing. So uh, even with my live shows, I only do about maybe two or three uh, original songs. I, I, I've kind of likened myself to Joe Cocker, where Joe Cocker was an interpreter of song who just chose great songs that the audience really can connect with. And the focus was on the music, uh, not me. And this way we have a common, we have a commonality. Uh, it's sustainable because after I go and leave this world, that music will still sustain itself because it's not about me. You know, it's like silicone bananas or silicone apples. You can't eat them, you know. Uh, so eventually you, you have to, uh, uh, you know, change things up. And I think when, when you're focused on me, look at me, look at me, look at me, that's not sustainable. It may be to some, but not 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 to me, you know, so I focus on, uh, Beatles and I focus on, you know, I do dust in the wind in my shows. I do, you know, I do, you know, Steeler's wheel stuck in the middle with you, you uh -huh. know? and to hear the, to hear the whole audience sing along. is just a, it's a wonderful experience, you know? And, uh, do you, um, and, do you, do you do solo or do you bring a band with you when you tour? Uh, this past year I've had both, uh, but, uh, the majority of it is just myself acoustically, uh, believe it or not. So, um, well, it's enough. Trying, <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And I, and I do think that's why I like the intimacy and connectivity, uh, focus because, uh, then you're able to share and you're able to connect with that audience. Um, and I think it, 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 it deepens your relationship. And then, uh, and then later on, you can change things up and do these bigger shows and, you know, all that sort of thing. So, uh, right, but I, right, right. but anyway, I'm, I'm off on a tangent here. So I love your tangents. Just like I love your music and your singing. This is uh this is Dan's website. You can go to Dan Schaefer music.com and, uh, you see his bio. He's got videos here. Um, there's, the, another one from The Voice, uh, not only was there the, the uh, blind audition, uh, but also he rocks out here on uh, Bad Company, I uh, Feel Like Making Love, and uh, he's got a sizzle reel here as well as uh, this. I, I'm a big um, 70s prog rock fan, um, ELP, Wonderful. King Crimson, oh. Old Genesis yes. with Peter Gabriel, yes, uh, <laughs> Super oh, Tramp, Pink too. Floyd, Th that Wonderful. is... That is the music of my soul, um, those epic, uh, you know, and so seeing this piece here, uh, you know, where you're singing Lucky Man, uh, which is just absolutely classic, um, is fantastic. Well, that was you, guys, you can poke around here and see all kinds of things. You know, you mentioned that um, some of the people you had worked with, and I just want to point out because there's a long list of people that you have sang with or been on stage with including uh, Dolly Parton uh, including uh, Jack White who's you know played with Rick Springfield and Tina Turner uh, you mentioned Carmen yes a piece um, you Love know Jack. pile with Leonard Skinner Derek St. Holmes who played with you know uh, Ted Nugent Jim. yeah uh, Kenny that played with Kid Rock and Kenny Olsen uh, yeah. that played with Alice Cooper like all these oh, guys Love it, Steve um, at what point, you know, do you go, wow, you know, I'm playing with the big boys. <laughs> well, it was really funny. Uh, my wife and I, when we had downtime, when they still had record stores, we'd go into 
the record shops and look at the bins and start going through all these records and say, wow, I've, I've worked with that guy. I've worked with that guy. I've worked with that guy. And it's just, uh, it, you know, you don't even think about it, uh, really. I'm, I've just been blessed, you know, and uh, um, it's, just, it's just something that comes about, you know. And uh, I just, you know, I just, I'm just such a fan of music, you know. I mean, in fact, you mentioned Yes. I, I digress a little bit, but Yes was the yeah. first concert I went to see at Colt Park in Hartford, Connecticut. Man, I saw them and... Uh, what year? No offense. Uh, it, let me see here. I was 16, so it must have been 1975 or 76. So would that have so been it, like yes. around the Fragile mm-hmm. Tour? It was the Fragile Tour. It was Roundabout, and Nailed it came it. out. It was like rockin' baby. And uh, they had, and I hate, and I hate to say it, but they had, uh, uh, they had, uh, what the heck was in front of them? They had, they had somebody that was a big, turned out to be a big artist later on, got booed off the stage. And I, and I said, oh my gosh, that poor fella. But yes, came on, man. And when they were doing Roundabout, it was just like so, inc- to, to see that, to hear these guys and, you know, the quality of musicianships, as you, you can, I'm sure you can appreciate Joel, you know. The musicianship, the quality of music, I mean, the songs, you know, whether you like it or not, it's like, you know, a fan of Rush or a fan of, you know, you either like it or you don't. Prog rock is a, is, is a but how can you not like, you know, John Anderson's voice when he mm. starts to sing, you know, you know, it's and beautiful. or to Steve, Steve Howe, you know, Steve Howe's guitar playing, you know, uh, you know, I was talking to Miss Teresa the other day, you know, and it kind of saddens me, you know, to see that we live in an era that, uh, you know, those types of qualities and, you know, striving for those things aren't even encouraged. We're, we're you know, we're not really necessarily striving for excellence in that, you know, that perspective. We're striving more for the aesthetics or the superficial, you know, it's like how much, how much of a great show can we put on and how many dance steps can we do? How many costumes can we change within like one song? And I'm not saying everybody's that way. Uh, not, I don't mean that, you know, disparaging or disrespectful to anybody, but I mean, that's one of the things why I love about Nashville. You can walk into any, any little bar downtown Nashville and walk in and see somebody on a stool with an acoustic guitar pouring their heart out. And uh, it's just an amazing thing, whether you like it or not, or think it's good or it's bad or whatever. It's almost irrelevant. Uh, they're honing in on their craft, you know, and, and I, and I just, I don't see a lot of that, but you see, yes. Oh my gosh. You know, I remember being a boy, you know, I mean, I strived to be Paul Rogers. I strived to be Paul McCartney. I strived, uh, every nuance. I, I sang their voice, you know, I understood their songs, you know, that, that's why, you know, that's why I was talking about, you know, television shows and this and that. You're, you're dealing with individuals who never went out and really played the bar scene, you know, and played 30, 40, 50 songs a night, every night. So my, my point is, is how can you write songs if you don't have those seeds to know, okay, I'm 15 seconds in. I need to get to by 16 seconds, 17, I need to get to that bridge or I need to get to that chorus, or I need, you know, there's certain timing issues. Same thing with jingles. You've got 15 seconds. You, in the first seven seconds, you better build it up. By time 15, you better be there, especially, especially if it's only a 30-second spot or a 60-second spot. You need to know where you're at, and that's an internal thing that because of doing it over and over and over again, or when you write a song, you know, where can I, like if you listen to, uh, Turn off your mind, relax, and float downstream. If you listen to like Beatles stuff, you know, I mean, you take one chord, C, in, in, but you see how John Lennon went way off, off that diving board, all over these places to reel in all these melodic structures, all these arrangements on one chord. It's very, you know, he had influences. He had seeds. He had something that was foundational. Uh, and I think that's life in general. If there's nothing foundational, you know, it, it's like it's like when you speak to, uh, uh, for instance, if you if you speak to say Eric Clapton, okay, I'll just use that because I, you know, anyway, you know, Eric Clapton will sit there and yes, he acknowledges he's Eric Clapton, but he's just Eric Clapton. He'll be speaking about Muddy Waters. He'll be talking about BB King. He'll be talking about Howlin' Wolf. 
you listen to Keith Richards. Keith Richards is Keith Richards, but he wants to talk about Helen Wolf. He wants to talk about Eric Clapton. He wants, you know, or you listen to, you know, Paul McCartney, or he's talking, or George Harrison. They're talking about Carl Perkins, or they're talking about, you know, whatever. Uh, it's never about my this or that or my music or the, you know, they don't need to do that. They don't. So I don't mean uh, I don't mean that disrespectfully to anybody. And it's just like you know, it's one of the reasons why I'm doing. I'm focused on material, great material that other people have written that we all share and love, mm. uh, and that makes a common mm. ground for both of us because we're still fans. And I think that's what audiences have loved about. I'm not just some cover guy going out and playing the bar band. It's not that at all. That's why I like, and like I said, I'm not trying to equate myself to Joe Cocker. I'm just saying his, we have Michael Bublé. We have all these other artists of today who've picked up that baton and are moving forward with it. I'm, I'm, I'm now a fan of Lady Gaga because she's doing the same thing. Well, there's not a male dominant vocalist right now. I'm not saying that's me, but there's not a rock guy right now who's taking that form of music, taking the Eagles or, t or taking, you know, America or taking Led Zeppelin and bringing that to a new audience that really wants to hear those songs and specifically picking the songs that, you know, like Daisy Jane, you know, or Sister Golden Hair or going to California by Led Zeppelin, or picking, you know, uh, Young Blood by, you know, the coasters, but then done by Bad Company. You know, when you start listening to those songs, uh, they're not being written today, and, and, and the market is longing for it. So I feel someone needs to bring it to them, and I happen to be a fan of that. So Yeah. Uh, well, well, in fact, anyway, that I'm, I'm, there's all these cover bands now that are, you know, basically replicas. You know, you have an Australian and a British, you know, Pink Floyd, right? That yes, yes. Um, they do their thing. Uh, you have Led Zeppelin knockoff bands. You have Genesis, you know, because these bands aren't together anymore. People long for this music. And uh, just a few months ago, I saw Petty Theft. And Tom Petty had just passed a few weeks earlier. Right. And right. these guys are playing this classic music. And talk about a guy who could work with two chords. I mean, Tom oh Petty was was able. I mean, I, I listen to Free Falling and think this is the simplest dang song. The the verse and the chorus, it's all the same, and yet he turned it into a masterpiece. Yes, yes, he does. I think there's the creative spirit. You know, it all goes back to critical thinking and and just. I mean, I can go into a variety of things in in as deep as as people want to, but it all starts as a little kid. How creative thinking starts to become a uh, part of what you are and do to go, here's my, here's, here's this, this block or this barricade that's preventing me from moving any further. Well, how do I get around it? How do I go through it? You know, uh, that's critical thinking, you know, it's how do I take a problem and turn it into something positive, you know? Well, it's the same thing with music. If you don't have a bunch of seeds that are within you to say, okay, here's a, here's a, well, I'll give you a good example. I was uh, uh, on a record with, uh, you may or may not know him, but you can always Google him later, but John Barry, uh, it was his last record. It was called, uh, it was on Capitol Records. It was Better Than a Biscuit. Uh, Chuck Howard was producing the record and said, Dan, you know, so-and-so has been producing this record, you know, the vocals on it. And we think that this is a single, but we don't know what to do with it. They never really did much with it. And, um, and I listened to it and instantly I was thinking shy lights, you know, for those of you who don't know the shy lights, Google them. They're great. Honey, Classic. you are my shining star, don't you go. Anyway, I love it. Anyway. And, uh, so they played me the track for John and I said, this is what we need to do. And that's exactly what I did because he was just saying, I've got to know there's nothing there. But I came up with this whole piece. I said, I've got to know, I've got to know. Would you believe in love? I've got to know, I've got to know. Ooh. I mean, just the whole backgrounds, you know, because I came from a time where you were listening to Queen or you were listening to Beatles and you were listening to the Shy Lights or Black Music at the time, you know. Look at, you know, the Spinners, the Four Tops, the, you know, Shy Lights stylistics, you know, and... uh and the 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 way the vocals and the orchestration was and how they arranged those vocals created something that was much greater than the song was, you know? I mean, 
the song was very simple. It, not better than the song was. I don't mean it that way. Uh, you know, they just, it, it just it very, they took simple and made it sound simple, but it was very complicated because there was all these moving parts and moving pieces that all worked together for the good. And uh, today, I don't know, if, you know, Mm-mm. and and it does affect it because as a writer, you know, and writers and friends of mine, and I know, and there again, I'm not trying to say, oh, yeah, in the past. And, but when you're a writer and you write like me, the only reason why I wrote was because I wanted to sing. So I would write melodic structures and I would listen to Beatles, you know, from a boy all the way up. And you would think about how do I go about and in, in not taking what is the obvious and going way beyond that. And, and, uh, but the problem is, is that it's very difficult to find artists now who will be able to sing those songs as you would or Paul McCartney. I mean, you can always tell that. You can take, take it, you know, there again, I don't mean this in a negative way, but just listen to the award shows, okay? Just listen to the award shows. And when someone tries to sing a Beatles song or someone tries to sing, um, you can tell right off the bat. And I don't mean that, you know, to be, to be anything other than you can see that. Whereas I don't think the songwriting in general today, Dan, I mean, because it's so commercial, um, you know, in no disrespect to other cultures and the music they're putting out, but I feel like that we really did live through the classic era of rock and roll. And I really, that- I do as well. I grew up listening to the radio as you did and the new Zeppelin song, you know, came out and, you know, the new Aerosmith and new Supertramp. I remember when those bands were producing new stuff and oh. we just took it for granted that this we had always had this kind of music. And now you turn on the radio and I wonder 20 years from now, how many bands are we going to look at from these last 10 years and say this is classic? I think they're going to be very few. I think there, yeah. there's a lot of forgettable um, music today, and that's unfortunate. It is. You know, even though we, we had that during the 70s and 60s and 50s and 40s, you know, we did. But you have to admit, I think it's just because, there again, the priorities have shifted. You know, it's not about the song. It's not about the vocalist. It's not about – that's why I love to see – you know, a current person like Lady Gaga, you know, to go out and do what she's doing, but she's side by side with Tony Bennett, you know, or she's side by side with Michael Bublé. They're individuals that are there again, are passing that baton forward. I've got a whole campaign called Keep the Rock Rolling, and uh, I know a lot of fans will know that, but that's what that means. It's just, you know, just keep that boulder going, whatever challenges you have in life, whatever, you know, but it also means keep rock rolling, you know, let's, whatever we find is, 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 sustainable whatever thing something that is good something that is uh positive something that is whatever makes us makes the best of us that's the thing that we need to sustain and to keep moving forward you know we all have junk we all have stuff you know but you know let's take the best of what we are and and pass that forward but i happen to agree with you i think for rock and roll I don't see where it's going to – I mean, for right now, in this current climate, there is no rock and roll. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you can say there were some great bands, you know, that came out of the 90s and, you know, with Nirvana. And, and you can see, the, the, you know, but that tended to wean down too, you know. There were some great bands that, that, you know, as far as rock is concerned. But look at R&B. Look at soul music. Where is it? I mean, there's – you don't see – uh, I mean, what they're calling R&B is not what I would say is R&B as compared no. to what, you know, uh, what, you know, Wilson Pickett. I mean, that was, you know, I mean, I don't, that was rock and roll, but it was R&B. The four rhythm tops, and blues. the Temptations, yeah. Diana Ross, yeah. the Supremes, right? The Spinners. Yes. You know, yes. Uh, uh, even, even uh, things like, uh, you know, Rick James and Cool in the Game. I love Rick James. Cool right? in the Game, yes. There you go, yeah. The, the good thing is, is that when you go out into the market and out into the street at street level, uh, middle America, man, that's what they want to hear. Mm-hmm. I was just up in, in uh, Rochester here uh, l- last weekend. I mean, there's yes, they were in a, you know, it, it was, it, you know, they were listening to country music, but they were listening to Rhinestone Cowboy. They're, mm-hmm. they're listening to, uh, you know, uh, Travis Tritt. And they were, I mean, I'm just saying, uh, you know, they're listening to, I mean, yeah, they had some stuff going on with some, some, you know, current stuff, but I just think that the people want to get back there again. I know I'm, I don't want to sound redundant, but 
intimacy and connectivity and whatever that is for that particular audience. But I think right now the market is 1966 to 77. We're there politically. We're there stylistically. We're there musically. We're there in a variety of ways. And when you go out into the market, uh, you know, buddy guy, woo! I saw a buddy guy flash there right yeah. there in front of me. Oh my gosh. Anyway, uh, you know, you can see people longing for song driven stuff with some guy sitting on a stool who can actually execute that stuff. And, uh, so, but, uh, j- just in case anybody might be interested, I'm doing, I'm, I'm just, I'm very new to this, but, uh, concert window, uh, dot com. I'm doing a, a live streaming show, uh, tomorrow, uh, at 8, 8 PM central time, uh, nine o'clock Eastern and, and so forth, but eight o'clock central time. Uh, and there again, it's very intimate. I don't do too many, streaming shows but it's something that i'm going to try to do more often because i have a lot of friends you know from south america and from uh uh you know uh you know the southeast asian markets who are fans of the voice and all that but but yeah but concertwindows.com forward hey, slash dan Schaefer music out. uh concertwindow.com uh, if you scroll down the page right here come to uh saturday at nine eastern there it is dan Schaefer live and intimate acoustic show and is this like a little teaser here if i click that no i'm not quite sure what uh it'll probably just say i i left it so this way uh i left it so this way you just click pay what you want kind of a thing and uh you'll be able to watch the show uh very again it's there again it's just very intimate and just you know if you want to give a buck i mean it doesn't matter it's not about the money right now for me so i just left it but if you want to give 100 bucks that's fine too so that's great. Uh, it's, you guys, it's just, go check this out. Concertwindow.com. The show is uh, Saturday night, 9 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock here in the uh, in the Rockies. Uh, Dan, thank you yeah. so much for spending time with me. This is um, this is just I been appreciate fantastic. you so much. Um, can I make a request for a closing song? Uh, if I can, if I know. Oh, I know you can because you mentioned it already. And I would okay. love if you would play Dust in the Wind. Well, I'll give the best shot. You got it. Excellent. And then um, and when we're done here, I'm going to drop you back down to the lobby afterwards, but stick around for just a moment because i got a couple things I want to talk to you about um, offline. If that's sure, good. you got it, buddy. All right, Dan Schaefer. Thank you. 
Beautiful. Kerry Livgren could write a song, couldn't he? Oh, man. I loved Kansas. I thought they were so great. Yeah. Wish I was feeling better. So, But anyway, hey, you keep moving forward. Keep that rock rolling, baby. Hey, thanks so much. <laughs> Dan Schaefer, a talented musician. You guys, be sure to check out his live show on concertwindow.com and check out more of his stuff at uh, danschafermusic.com. Uh, that's one way. The other way that you can see what Dan has got going on is on his Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Dan Schaefer Music. Go and, uh, and like it. Thanks again, Dan. You, uh, you're awesome. Thank you, buddy. I really appreciate you. My best in your family. Hang tight just a second, okay? And thanks to all of you for, uh, for watching. Wow, so great. Teresa Ann, thanks for uh, lining up, Dan, for, uh, for this episode. And thanks to all of you for watching. Um, Monday, Be Live Weekly, Owen Hemseth taking over, picking up the mantle, carrying the torch, the baton forward for BeLive.tv. I want to give a quick shout out for those of you in the live video space. Make sure that you get your dot .live domain important if you're going to be broadcasting why not brand yourself with the dot live domain go to joel 20 dot live and search for your name if you find a regular domain name there that you want to use to brand yourself it'll automatically put 20 percent off into your cart joel 20 dot live all right hey great seeing you guys as always until next time